Uh, this month we're going to be talking about how cities can help their businesses achieve energy savings. It's a topic we've been hearing a lot about from folks across the state. There's been some great examples, so we're happy to highlight them today. Uh, my name is Amir Nadav, and I'm the Green Set Cities Co-Director. And uh, why don't we do a quick round of introductions around the room and then on the webinar, and then we'll kind of dive into the agenda. Patrick. I'm Patrick Mathwick, Minnesota Green Corps member with the Great Plains Institute. And I'm Eric Lehman. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Division of Energy Resources. Williams, I'm a cost associate at Fresh Energy. Laura Milburn, I'm the Building Advisor for Green Subsidies with Minnesota Social Control Agency. Good morning, I'm Peter Lindstrom. I'm the Local Government Outreach Coordinator for the Clean Energy Resource Team. Uh, good morning, Philip Music, uh, Co-Director of Green Subsidies with them here. Sean Sewell, City of Lakewood, Environmental Planner. Yvonne Pfeiffer, Excel Energy, Community Channel Manager. I'm Jay Lafayette. I'm the Green Corps member serving with the U.S. Green Building Council. Sherry Berlinka, I'm the Executive Director of the U.S. Green Building Council. And Alexis Strachnett with CERT, uh, Clean Energy Resource Team with the Behavior Change and Metrics Coordinator. I'll be talking to you in a few minutes. <laughs> All right, and on the webinar, we have Andrea Lauer, Bruce Matwig, Chris Johnson, Edward Cohen, Emily Northey, Hannah Beeler, Jacob Thunderer, uh, Christian Moores, Maggie Kozak, Mark Thompson, Terry Gibbs, and Trayton Eatman. Great. Thank you all, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so in addition to this live event, this uh, webinar will be recorded. It will be available as a resource to bring that city um, into the future in that uh, We're excited to be joined today by some great speakers uh, to highlight some excellent work happening across the state. Uh, Alexis Trotschett from the Clean Energy Resource Team will be telling us about a canopy lighting program for businesses. Terry Brzezinka from the U.S. Green Building Council will be telling us about resources related to building energy benchmarking why that's a helpful strategy. And then we'll hear from Eric Green with the Department of Commerce on property effects clean energy financing, a tool which the state legislature authorized a few years ago. Now quite a few cities have authorized in their local jurisdictions that we're seeing projects happening across the state. And then for a local perspective, we'll hear from Becky Shaw with the city of Minneapolis on how cases are playing out in their city. And then we'll hear from Sean Finwall about some innovative work happening in the city of Maplewood around engaging the commercial sector as well. Oh. This is me, for those of you <laughs> who don't know. Why don't we go to my slide, Patrick? So I just wanted to say a few words just to frame up the topic and introduce it, why we're talking about this today. Uh, <clears throat> So you ask on energy costs on any given year, most of that going out of state because we don't have many fossil resources here. Uh, commercial and industrial businesses account for 50% of our statewide energy use, so quite a lot, um, a significant impact. And every community has businesses and every community wants thriving businesses. There's a real opportunity for job creation, for energy saving retrofits and projects, and for actual cost savings to businesses through investment in energy efficiency. In addition to those numbers, uh, there's been quite a bit of research over the last couple of years on the actual economic benefits of simply having energy efficient buildings. So this slide here kind of shows a summary of some of these studies looking at Energy Star certified buildings, those that are considered to be in the top 25% of efficiency across the country. And what research has shown is that um, these types of buildings generally show some kind of economic advantage, whether it's a rental rate premium or they command more money at point of sale or they attract more tenants. Um, there's an increasing body of research that energy efficient buildings are attractive buildings um, from a business perspective as well. Uh, now, how do we get there? Um, 
there are many different pathways to achieving energy savings, and there's no one single silver bullet. We know that you need good energy data. We know that benchmarking is important. We know that there are things like assessment, energy audits, assessments, recommissioning. Tenants have an important role to play. Um, how energy costs and expenditures get, get built into the lease contract can have important implications. There are financing tools. Cities play a role in terms of the building codes. We have great utility incentives here in the state of Minnesota and great utility programs and resources. But how do we make that whole landscape of opportunities easily accessible in our communities to businesses? Uh, that's one of the challenges and one of the issues we're going to be talking a bit about today. And finally, we're talking about engaging businesses, uh, but this is a Green Step Cities workshop. So why cities, why local government? Well, the reason why we're making this connection is because cities have many relationships with businesses in their communities. And cities have many important tools in their toolbox that they can use and leverage to make these programs more accessible to businesses and to help connect them to resources. So if you think about the range of things cities do, they provide incentives in some cases, whether it's financing, or various other uh, rebates or incentives. They are capable of providing assistance and partnerships with service providers to make these resources more accessible to their businesses. And cities have an important role to play in terms of regulation for building codes, enforcement, and various ordinances and licensing processes that they can connect to energy resources as well. So that's just a brief overview of um, the topic today. And why don't we dive right into our presentation? I'd like to introduce Alexis Trachinet, the Behavior Change and Metrics Coordinator of the Clean Energy Resource Team. We'll talk about some of the great work you're doing. <laughs> great. Thanks. Um, so I've been with CERC for a couple of years now, two and a half, I think, um, in this role as Behavior Change and Metrics Coordinator. And uh, it's a wonky title, isn't it? But <laughs> I'll give you a little background on why it's called that. Um, but here at stations, because cities have multiple stations within their territory. Um, and so you have a, a broader reach than uh, we might have. Let's look at it. Not, there we go. Oh, it's a slow. There's a role for that. But we, um, these are some ways that we help. We love sharing resources. <laughs> uh, sometimes we make educational campaigns, like a right light guide or What's a Community Solar Garden, and we've come up with a lot of other uh, resources along with um, just that broad fact sheet for Community Solar Gardens. We have our energy stories. This is an a email digest that goes out every uh, couple weeks with stories about actual projects happening in Minnesota. Um, yes, of course, <laughs> is another uh, resource that we help local units of government um, learn about that financing option. And seed grants uh, is another way that we help you know, offering anywhere from like seven hundred to two thousand dollars, maybe five thousand dollars at the most to a community based project to help get that project off the ground. This is just a sampling of, you know, some of our programming if you're not familiar with us. But I'm here to talk to you about a particular kind of programming called certified campaigns. We love inserting our name into to words like certainly and <laughs> certified. <laughs> and um, these we like to think of as kind of um, sort of um, homegrown or whole cloth programming that we put together. We try to take a look at some research, um, typically coming out of the Department of Commerce Division of Energy Resources, to guide us in a direction of some solid programming. And, um, and then we identify barriers and benefits that, you know, will move people to action, um, and then design a program around that. So uh, these are campaigns where we're providing Minnesotans with clear and actionable ways to save energy. And these programs really are targeted at energy efficiency. We have other programming for renewables. Um, we have two programs running in parallel right now. One is LED lighting for turkey barns. We call that one gobbling up savings. And then uh, LED lighting in gas station canopies. So that, you know, that just that exterior canopy over the fuel pump station part of the facility. Um, we picked gas stations because there's over 2,000 of them in Minnesota, and they're spread out all over the state, as you can see, and a majority, a very dense um, arrangement of them in the metro. <laughs> um, but it, we, we work across the state, and gas stations are across the state. It was a good match as far as audience goes. 
Um, within that, we're focusing on independent or non-chain station owners. And that's because they have little buying power compared to their chain counterparts. They also have a small staff and may not be thinking about energy much at all. Um, and youth. This lighting, as you guys know, canopy lights, some of them are on even 24 hours a day, even if they don't need to be. Um, but anywhere from 10 to 24 hours a day. So that's a lot of energy savings. If you love numbers, that could be anywhere from 10 to 30,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, just a background on the technology a bit. We're trying to switch canopies out from a bulb technology of high pressure sodium or metal halide bulbs using anywhere from a typically for a canopy 250 to 400 watts per bulb and any canopy might have 12 to 20 lights um, to a fixture um, that has LEDs in them. Um, and LEDs are great because they're more directional. They don't disperse the light as much. So as far as a nighttime uh, sky quality, um, it can work to improve that as well. And they don't need to be changed out very often. <laughs> uh, we hear from station owners, they're up every couple of months trying to change a bulb, either a staff member on a tall ladder or hiring an electrician to come each time. And that gets costly, and it can be dangerous for the staff. Uh, so that's a little bit about the two ball types. So really we're switching from some of this older technology where you pop a lid and put in a new ball to a whole new fixture that can last around 11 years. Um, and these are some of the selling points. This is why a station would think about doing this. They can reduce their canopy lighting uh, costs up to 75 percent. Um, with rebates, they might be able to pay this off in about a year. <laughs> um, so that's really hard to look away from, or four years without utility rebates. A lot of them are switching to LEDs because they know it adds to their business value. It's creating a brighter, more attractive station. People obviously feel safer and more welcomed at a place like that. The reduced maintenance costs and just the overall strengthening of their business if they don't need to have those additional operating costs. Um, like I said, we base our um, programming off of research as much as we can. And uh, Michael's Energy performed a study with 50 convenience stores in 2013. Um, and they looked at all sorts of energy saving actions within a convenience store. Coolers, um, the motors with those coolers, variable speed drives, uh, lighting in the coolers. Um, I know I'm forgetting some, but Canopy lighting was one of them. And as far as like a single action a convenience store owner could take, canopy lighting rose to the top as far as, you know, a lot of savings for one action. And that's what appealed to us for this campaign. Um, and in the study, about 21 were, um, 21 of, out of 50 of the stores were independent. And so they did a nice job studying the sector we were most interested in helping. And uh, they surveyed them. And only two out of the 21 at the time in 2013 had LED lights in their canopies. So we knew there was a big opportunity there. And um, as far as how they think about energy, they're thinking about just paying their bills and maybe turning off lights behind themselves. Um, so not maybe not as deep of a um, uh, perspective on what they could possibly do with energy. And then um, for as far as what they're thinking about for finances, they're just interested in simple payback. So that's nice. That made it easy on us to not have to be overly complicated in our messaging. Um, and they really have a need for project management or technical assistance. Again, they don't have the expertise on energy necessarily. And so um, we have a, a role to play there for them to help bridge that, that gap. And they love seeing or hearing about others' success. So if they know that Jim in the town next door did this and he's seeing good results, both business-wise and, and staff um, management, uh, <clears throat> that, that gets them thinking, like, yeah, I could do that if Jim did it. Um, all right, a little happy. <laughs> so how are we helping? We're raising awareness. We're pointing people to high-quality products. And we're pointing people to their utility rebates. Um, along the lines of awareness, we've been partnering closely with the two major um, associations within Minnesota that work with service stations the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association and 
the Minnesota Service Station and Convenience Store Association, which goes by the shorter acronym MSSA. Um, and actually in April, mid-April, we'll be at an expo in St. Paul River Center where statewide station owners come and learn about new things they can do for their station. We're going to um, share a table with the, the Lung Association there to get the word out a bit more. Uh, we also have, uh, along these lines, we have our own staff across the state um, going station to station as they're out driving the meetings. So we've had at least 150 stations that way, um, getting the word out. High quality products. Um, here we, okay, <coughs> oh, not yet. Um, just had them in a different order. <laughs> we, um, at first we wanted to do a bulk buy where we pick a single product and offer a cheap price for it and direct people to that one product. Uh, we realized we were a little out of our league when we tried to do that. <laughs> uh, the lighting world is fast changing. There's a lot of com competition. Um, there's a lot of sophisticated products. And so we did not feel like we could point out one product, our team, and, and take on kind of that, that risk. So we instead um, decided to create a list of technical qualifications. Um, includes things like, you know, lifetime and the color of the lights and quality of the light. Um, that a light would have to meet in order to be listed on our website and shared with people. So that's the way we did it. We partnered with utility representatives and a lighting consultant to get that done, and we felt much better going into the, um, the program with that approach, kind of fixtures out there, and we came up with 12. So this is a, a spend um, price and everything, um, but it uh, isn't so exhaustive of a list that people get overwhelmed quickly. This is the kind of list they would share with their electrician, likely. Um, most stations have their own electrician. And so it provides valuable information, like just a quick little photo of what the, the light looks like, um, model information and how it's mounted, who to contact next if they want it. They're not, there's one where they call me and I was kind of caught off guard the other day where I was like, oh, you're calling me for a price? No, I'm not the right person and I had to point them to the right person. But otherwise, there's a contact person for uh, each product that they work with that person next. And then we provide some technical information to get them out the gate um, successfully. Uh, like they can look up their own lots for their canopy and see which one might be a good model to replace it with if they just want to go one to one. There's installation instructions and specifications they can download from this link. And then um, whether or not the product is uh, made in the USA or manufactured in the USA. And then a relative um, scale for product cost. So our, the products on this page range anywhere from 300 to 800 per fixture. And so this little price symbol gives you a sense of where it sits in that range. This is all available at our website. Uh, utility rebates. We surveyed um, utilities across the state, all 180 electric utilities, and got responses from 56 of them. So we're pretty happy with that response. Um, we have them all listed on our website alphabetically, um, exactly what kind of rebate you get for this type of um, action, upgrading the exterior lighting or canopy lighting. Some of them have a dollar amount per fixture. Other people have a dollar amount per kilowatt saved. Other utilities have a dollar amount per kilowatt hour saved. So it's all stated there clearly. Um, again, alphabetical, and it provides that information right away, right away of what you're going to get per um, unit. And then a little bit about eligibility, quickly um, links people to the rebate form and who to contact if they have questions at the utility. And those are all listed out at LED canopy rebate. Here's where you guys come in, <laughs> uh, Green Step Cities, how, this, how the two programs work well together. Um, we identified that, um, as Amir said, cities have good relationships with their businesses, and also Green Step Cities um, could participate or leverage this program in their own cities and make progress on a best practice action, specifically um, 25.2. So this is under Green Business Development. And um, best practice action two is where you're helping uh, businesses connect to a marketing or outreach program. And this varies anything from simply putting something on a website to having your own program you develop. Well, the one in the middle is leveraging someone else's program <laughs> versus 
light up your station and save program. <laughs> so you could get two stars for this best practice action simply by um, using our resources and sharing them with your station. And so this is how you can help. <laughs> I have um, outreach packets um, today, and I know um, some folks might have already uh, participated on with this on the phone. You can pass that around if you'd like. There's six of them here. And um, they are intended, you know, for Green Step coordinators. And I have a packet that Patrick, if he hasn't already, for the folks on the phone, he'll email out the packet to you. We have one of those. Patrick says he'll email it after the meeting today. But the packet, as the slides say here for the folks on the phone, it just gives you an overview of how you can help on the cover letter. And then it um, gives you some outreach guidance on like how to identify an independent, what to look for when you pull into a station to know if they have LEDs or not. Um, and along those lines, there's a, a training, what I call my photo training guide. It's basically got a breakdown of kind of where we're coming from and a little bit about LEDs and what an LED fixture looks like and everything. Um, and then it also has a script. So let's say you're a Green Step coordinator or you have some city staff that you could send out on the streets talking to station owners. It gives you a sense of how to have that conversation with the script. Um, and then in the back, I can't believe I don't have this in front of me right now. Sorry, guys. But a flyer. It looks a lot like that. This is a flyer you could leave with them and uh, let them know to be in touch with CERTs for additional help. And if you run out of those uh, forms, you can get more at the CERT website, um, LED Canopy hashtag share. So, um, I think if there's anything else. Do you guys have any questions about this campaign? What? Um, so, uh, oh, use the microphone. Oh. So um, a couple questions. I was wondering the payback calculation. Is that does that include the maintenance savings or is that in addition? So what you listed? Oh, good question. That does not include the maintenance savings. So similar um, with LED street lighting, we know that it's actually the maintenance savings that make that effort far more valuable than just the energy savings alone. But that's just on energy savings. And then, um, I was also wondering, just because um, you said that the market is changing so quickly for the LEDs, uh, how long the campaign is going and whether you'll be updating the eligible, you know, going through again with the newest entries in the market to update your list of eligible products? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hope to let this one go through the end of the year. I'm not sure we're going to go much beyond the end of 2015, just to kind of freshen up and move on. We've been uh, running it since about um, in earnest since about August of last year. Um, um, and we will, I do need to reconnect with the company and make sure they, ha they haven't changed their models. I know there's a couple that we're waiting for certain uh, certification to meet our qualifications. I keep checking back with them, like, is your product ready for our list yet? <laughs> so I don't want too many on there, but um, it is nice to make sure more folks are included if they qualify. Any other questions about the campaign? Because really, I want to do a plug on the, the conference. <laughs> Third 2015 community-based clean energy, uh, community-driven clean energy conference. Uh, this happens, this wonderful event happens only every two years. Um, and it's happening March 10th and 11th. Um, it's a ton of fun. Um, I've only been once since my time in CERT, but I had a blast the last time. And we're all looking forward to um, having another good Good time here. And it's a day and a half. We're going to do the full day first, and the half day will be second with in-depth workshops. There's a lot of great stuff for cities on here, um, including LED street lighting and um, more about financing options like PACE and GUS. Um, community solar gardens. How could we host this conference without that topic this year? Um, there's going to be tons on that as well, and lots of great networking opportunities and a great exhibitor hall, tons of eye candy in the exhibitor hall this year, cards and panels, and it'll be really a fun exhibit hall. Bill? Uh, so Alexis, I, I remember when CERTs came out with these campaigns, and I thought they really were, I mean, they really sort of 
um, sort of souped enough to you know, open up the box and go out and work. So I'm just curious, are you looking ahead to a future campaign? Can you give us a little like preview of what the thing is? Uh, you know, not yet, oh, honestly. Not yet. We're like a little underwater. Really? We'll look out ahead <laughs> on the next campaign. It'll probably be, I, I lean towards something a bit bulk buy-ish like we had just to kind of to try that model again. So we used to, we did spray valves and vending misers and faucet aerators in bulk buy form. So we went, hey, you know, all across the state, like, you know, get these cheap things that save lots of energy. And um, and then we've shifted to these more uh, assistance intensive kind of programs. And there is a very different flavor. So I'm curious to try back on the, the bulk buy version and see if, how that, if it feels uh, successful too. Well, thanks for having me. I'm going to um, stick around, so definitely ask me questions. Oh, I brought plenty of these for you to actually take with you. I mean, not just one, guys. I mean, take three or four and hit up some stations yourself if you would like. Um, and plenty of conference brochures. Again, uh, we have a bit too many of these really close to the conference, so if you could take some and leave them in coffee shops and hand them out at meetings, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis. We appreciate all the work you do with First Service to create a campaign that makes it easier for businesses to identify energy saving opportunities. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Sherry Brzezinka, the Executive Director of the U.S. Green Building Council, Minnesota Chapter, and our sponsor of the workshop today, along with your Dell Energy, our sponsor of the workshop <laughs> series. Um, Sherry's been with the Green Building Council since 2009 previously had some great experience in the construction industry, and you may all know LEED through USGBC through the LEED Building Certification Program, but USGBC is also involved in other great work. Um, so Sherry will tell you a bit about the tools and resources to help businesses identify energy. Thanks, Amir. I can figure out how to work this.
just a general definition, it's the process of tracking the energy consumed over time of an existing building and then comparing those results um, to their, their themselves or to some other standard. So there's a, a couple of different means by which you can conduct an energy comparison. Um, first of all, to compare a building against itself um, for a set period of time and to really create a baseline from which um, the building can then try to implement changes and understand their energy use. There's also the model of comparing against similar types of buildings within a population so that um, a building can see how they compare against like buildings. And a popular model for that is the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Um, and then there's the, the, comp, the combined approach, really um, setting that predefined baseline plus using some type of an energy sim simulation model to gain a score. Um, and benchmarking or measuring energy use um, can be beneficial throughout um, a building cycle. So whether a building is um, being, a new building is being designed or a new project being created for a capital improvement project, um, it's great to compare energy usage with like buildings to kind of set your um, sustainability goals. Then after the project's completion, to verify that those goals are actually being met and the savings are what um, were expected, or to earn a certification like LEED or Energy Star or others. And then ongoing, it's really helpful to help um, create energy budgets, influence change, and like Amir mentioned, there is um, value in real estate transactions for buildings that are more energy efficient. Um, what many, um, what we're seeing a trend is many um, state and local governments are across the country are looking at um, engaging in bench, benchmarking ordinances as a way to really encourage um, better and more efficient building stock throughout their communities. And so this um, is really done by creating an ordinance that requires a building to benchmark and, um, and then having that data available so that tenants, building owners, people in that community can use that to influence and make their decisions. And the more that that availability of that data is around, it drives the market towards valuing better and efficient buildings. And it also, um, the, the key to a benchmarking ordinance is providing support and connecting those building owners then with different um, incentive programs that are available and helping them to take that data and then improve their building. Um, and then, like I said, that results in an overall more efficient building stock for that community. So there's a lot of value in that. Um, we're seeing, we're seeing, um, trends across the nation of um, cities that have been passing benchmarking and transparency policies um, in different um, areas. You can, and the city of Minneapolis, of course, has passed their ordinance in 2013, and that's well underway. And you can see the trend is um, that governments across the country are not only focusing on benchmarking their own publicly owned buildings, but engaging the commercial sector in this effort as well. And I have a snapshot of what's going on more around our region. You can see that there's several cities and states who have passed ordinances here in the Midwest and who are considering doing this as well. And in addition to a requirement or a mandated ordinance, there's also the opportunity to do a voluntary program more of a challenge, and you can see the, the little lightning bolt shows um, cities here in the Midwest who have implemented challenges and are having some success with that. So it doesn't have to be a mandated policy. Um, for example, the city of Columbus and the city of um, St. Louis both have challenges underway, and typically that looks like um, a city will set an uh, energy reduction goal that they want to achieve, and then within a period of time that they'd like to see that saving. And then just encouraging buildings to voluntarily sign up for the challenge and to start benchmarking and start reporting and start um, implementing ways that they can help get to that savings. 
So whether it's a voluntary or um, mandated type of an ordinance, the key for benchmarking is really to um, encourage many buildings to be measuring. That's really the first step um, for change is to understand how your building is operating and then um, you can start to realize ways to make it better. In fact, there um, was a study of 35,000 buildings in Energy Star Portfolio Manager that showed just by benchmarking, the act of benchmarking alone realized an average of 7% energy savings over three years. So just um, seeing, seeing what's in front of you is going to cause um, maybe just some behavioral changes in and of itself that will result in savings. Um, it also shows that when a, when a building starts benchmarking for the first time and sees the building performance, they're going to see a whole lot of opportunities to reduce energy just through no or low cost. There's always that low-hanging fruit that you can take advantage of. If you don't know what your building is doing, you can't understand um, how to make it better. So benchmarking promotes action and also makes um, energy efficient buildings that are more profitable and valuable at resale. So there's a lot of benefits to engaging your local community in benchmarking as a, as a city. Um, the U.S. Green Building Council also offers some resources to um, help with that. We are happy to do presentations at the council level or to others um, just on benchmarking in general, what it is, what are the trends going on. We also have presentations on people who are looking at considering a policy of um, what that would look like and different ways to do that. We offer assistance um, for those that are undergoing um, trying to pass an ordinance. Um, we've got, we're working in conjunction with the U.S. Green Building Council in Illinois on a regional campaign that um, we'll be producing a white paper in April that we'll be able to share that kind of um, shows how cities have um, successfully passed and implemented these types of ordinances, and we're gathering um, up a lot of resources that have been already created by those cities in order to be successful, so there's templates and tools and things that you can use. Um, we can also help build coalition support around an effort like this. Um, for example, when the city of Minneapolis was um, in the process of the ordinance, we were able to help out with at various public meetings and try to um, bring um, people who were supportive to be able to come in and talk and just share the benefits. And of course, implementation is also really important. It's, it's not going to be successful to pass an ordinance and not be able to help implement it successfully and help the businesses that are affected by it. So in the cities that are um, already undergoing this, such as um, Chicago and Minneapolis, we are um, also bringing a lot of the implementation resources to, to share. And then the final thing that I wanted to leave you with is um, we are partnering with the uh, Great Plains Institute and um, Energy Smart on a grant that was awarded to us through the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, an environmental assistance grant, and it's the Minnesota Energy Star Building Benchmarking and Certification Challenge. So we are just we haven't um, formulated the whole. Um, challenge what it will be yet. We're just in the very beginning stages of this, but it will be a statewide outreach campaign. We will be um, encouraging buildings across the state to sign up for this, to, um, to start benchmarking, and to use Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And another goal of this challenge will be to increase the Energy Star certifications in the state. Um, as part of this, there will be some on-site consultations um, provided to buildings and some support with the uh, Energy Star Portfolio Manager and with um, being able to achieve certification. So we have some, some resources there. And then we'll be looking um, for a deeper engagement pilot in a, a partner community. So that might be a great way for um, one of the cities to partner with us and um, really deep dive in and see how this could be replicated in other cities across the state. So um, we're really hopeful that all of you will help us um, 
with promoting this and with getting this out, again, like with your connections to your business community, helping get the word out. And, um, and if there is a city who is considering um, some kind of a benchmarking challenge, this would be a really great opportunity um, for you to work with us on that. So more to come on that. And that, again, this is a way for Green Step Cities to help achieve some of, some of those goals as well. So that is the end of my presentation. And I don't know if anyone has any questions. Patrick? There's one question from online. So Ray Schmidt asks, how does benchmarking work with state building codes? Um, you know, that's a great question. I don't, it, it, pardon? Complementary, complementary to state building codes. It's not required by a state building code, but it could, you know, definitely help. It's because it, Yeah, because the, um, it just requires them to say how much energy they're using. It doesn't require any improvements or anything. All the improvements would be voluntary. So it really, um, you know, doesn't go against the building code in any way. Is there a certain type of um, building you're looking for? So when you find a city that wants to partner, um, would you be asking them to reach out to a certain kind of um, business or institution, or is it kind of anybody who wants to participate? Right. It will be anybody with the challenge that we're doing. We want to get a wide variety of building types to participate, so we would be welcoming any building that wants to participate in the challenge. Um, it will be with the assistance and um, the energy smart portion of the assistance. There are certain, there will be certain um, They'll go through uh, looking at the building and seeing if the building could be likely to qualify for Energy Star. So, in order to get the assistance for the Energy Star and to achieve the certification, there we we will have to look and see if the building would be applicable to that. But for the challenge, you know, to get any kind of building to be benchmarking and to be looking at improvements, we would be encouraging that. Sherry, are you looking for one city or several cities to partner with? Um, is I there a certain just, type of city that you're looking at? I think we're really looking for one city, but again, we haven't really defined the entire scope of our project yet, so there could potentially be more than one if it was a good, a, a good fit. And go ahead. And it's one pilot city, but then, of course, in your general statewide campaign, it could be any city would be using those resources.
so yeah, today what I want to talk about is, is property assessed clean energy um, and how it can actually help drive economic development while helping communities reach their sustainability goals. That's particularly resonant with the Great Step Cities uh, as, as a group of cities. Um, and so, what is do? <laughs> so kind of stepping back, I, I think some people know or have heard the word PACE, but, but what is it really for a business? And it's the financial tool that allows businesses to access capital for investment in energy efficiency or renewable projects. That capital is accessed through, through a special assessment against the property, which I'll be talking a little bit more about. Um, and, and so what is, the, the capital is provided through the assessment against the property, and it's using those energy savings for that production to service that debt or that special assessment against the property. So for the business, at the end of the day, this is a budget neutral, cash flow positive proposition for any business that's looking to do investment in energy efficiency or renewables in the businesses. Um, and so what are some of those benefits? Well, one, it's going to help lower those operational costs, uh, which is going to help increase revenue for that business. If they're not every year having to increase uh, those operational costs as cost of energy increases, uh, if, they, if they do these types of projects, they can capture those savings and that can ultimately lead to more revenue. Again, as I mentioned, this case assessment uh, can be done with no upfront cost for the business, which I think is very important. Uh, they're structured to be cash flow positive from day one. Uh, that's kind of a requirement. Another important thing for businesses is this off-balance sheet. So this is not showing up as a debt for a business. Uh, because in fact what you're actually using are the operational savings, the money that would have normally been spent on utilities, or as was discussed with the lighting replacement, the physical act of replacing those light bulbs and the costs associated with that labor. Uh, so it, it's a powerful tool for businesses that want to invest in energy efficiency or renewables, but they really want to save their capital to grow their business. So it's a way of capturing that opportunity. Um, you know, that's, that's what I'm saying. It, it kind of helps out for the growth. And, and one of the limitations of it is it is only up to 20% of the property value. So it's not like something that can get unmanageable as far as the investment in these business ideas. Um, what does it do for the communities that create or allow a case program to be operated within their territory, well, from the start, it, I think it really helps drive that positive economic development and it helps retain jobs in your community. I consider it positive because it, it increases the business's competitive, uh, competitiveness. Every time they're, again, saving money uh, in their day-to-day -day expenses, they get to use that capital for something more valuable to the business. And ultimately, that means that they're going to stay in business and they're going to be paying property taxes and all those other additional benefits for the community uh, or for the city itself. It, as we've heard, it helps increase property values uh, within the business sector. And I think that's important to every city as they're looking at operating um, their budgets themselves. It helps with reducing the aggregate consumption. I know particularly with regional cities and a lot of metro cities with regional indicators. There are a lot of goals that are being uh, established to reduce energy consumption, reduce carbon emissions, and by providing this resource to your businesses, you're helping solve those problems. Uh, so those are all things why I do consider the positive economic impact on the, on the community. Um, so with regard to case, there are certain things that are eligible that can uh, be done as far as improvements. And we've talked about lighting. There might be motors or a building envelope uh, within the actual structure of the building. It might be the energy management system. There's ways of improving when you know the heat is on or when the lighting is on. And, and through some of those tools, you can get really quick payback. Those quick paybacks can also often help address some of those longer-term, high
higher cost investments in, as far as HVAC and electrical systems. Uh, and so by bundling that one-year payback of a lighting project, uh, maybe there's a furnace that has to be replaced that has a 15-year payback. By bundling those two uh, energy conservation measures together, they can reduce the payback of the HVAC system, which allows them to pay for it, again, through the savings that are generated through the lighting. So it's a creative way of, of capturing those savings and bundling them to do more. And, and PACE is one of those tools that can help do the deeper dive retrofit. Uh, it also opens up the opportunities for renewable. So if businesses want to uh, install a, a photovoltaic system or solar thermal or ground source heat pump, those are all eligible opportunities for businesses to look at. Uh, and then there's even custom. Uh, those, those could be anything. It'll get down in particular with the business. It could be an industrial sector that has some, some unique criteria uh, in their production. And, and so that can be looked at as a one-off. Um, so what is this process? And again, I'm trying to keep this at a high level because we'll get to it. There's a very easy way to access this program and that's the State Health Board Authority or the South West Harbor Chief. But in general, uh, what does the city have to do to allow this uh, resource to be provided to the business? It starts with establishing a, a, a PACE program or accessing an existing one. And there are two programs throughout the state. One is the case of Minnesota. It's operated by the State Health Board Authority, and it's statewide. There's another one which is within the Southwest RDC region, and they have an 18 county uh, rural, uh, Minnesota Rural Energy Board territory, and there are 18 counties, and any city within those can access that program directly. So once you've signed up as a city, that will allow business owners to go get an energy audit completed or a feasibility study if it's on the solar side to identify those opportunities for savings or production in the case of solar. Um, they fill out a simple with the Port Authority, I think a one and a half page application. Uh, so fairly streamlined uh, in accessing the capital. They will use the energy audit as the basis for that cash flow. They will look at those savings and they will structure the term of that financing to, again, be cash flow neutral and, and uh, uh, no upfront cost to deliver that. Once they've approved the financing, they will then contact the city uh, to assess that property. That's the second step. So the first one was the joint powers agreement. The second one is make the assessment. And then what happens is the property owner uh, receives the financing. They complete the project, and they start generating savings. Those savings are then used to pay the special assessment. So every six months, when the cities aggregated those payments, they will transfer that back to the Port Authority, and those are the three steps the city basically has to do in allowing pace to occur within their territory. So it's a pretty simple process uh, for communities provide this opportunity. Um, and kind of just from a cash flow, and this is a little funky, but up at the top, uh, again, we start with the concept of the program's been approved, the, the business owner contacts the utility or uh, provider, and they do an energy audit. They find out what those savings are, and they say, great, I want to take this, and I want to get this done. Then in this case, the program administrator under the energy audit and feasibility studies, they would validate those savings. So they would look those over. They would assure that those savings of production are going to be able to repay the debt. They use that as a basis of, of securing the financing. And again, once that financing has been secured, the assessment goes against the property. The owner receives the capital. They hire the contractors complete the work. And again, the savings now start to accumulate 
and those go back to the program administrator on a semi-annual basis. So it's just kind of a self-perpetuated process until those uh, assessments are paid off, and then it's savings for the business. And I think that's the cool thing about this is, again, lighting project may take one year to pay off. But the savings are going to occur for, I think you said they last for 11 years. So 10 years of gain, that's, that's pretty real to the business. Um, maybe it's a larger investment. And this is where I would say pace works really well for the deeper retrofits, for the longer term paybacks that aren't easily captured with that uh, simple payback or one to two years where businesses don't want to tie up capital, perhaps for 15 years. Um, this is a way for them to do that. There are other access, there are other points of access. Uh, they call Port Authority administers the Trillion BTU program, which is a loan program up to five years. So in between paying for something directly because the savings are going to come back so quickly or looking to maybe I want to do something that has a three-year payback. Well, I'm probably going to take it alone uh, through the Port Authority or some other entity uh, and pay for that. But when they're deeper retrofits or higher cost investments, it really provides savings. Pace is a really simple way to access that. Um, I think that's right, yeah. So again, uh, it was mentioned in 2010, the legislature authorized the, the statutes up above and over them. Um, but what it, what it provided is the structure for Pace programs to be created in the state. And since that time, the first one was the city of Edina. They created the Emerald Energy Program. And they chose to join with uh, Peace of Minnesota under the St. Paul Port Authority just because, again, administrative functions are a little bit easier by having the Port Authority do the whole state. Uh, so those are the cities and counties that I'm aware of that have been approved in the case of Minnesota. And I know that there are a number of other counties that are going through the process. It's in Hennepin, Dakota, uh, Washington County. Uh, and some others are looking at it. I know some other cities are working with the Port Authority and going through that process. Um, I want to take the opportunity to highlight again the other program that's out there, which is the Southwest Regional Development Commission's PACE program. They similarly have a PACE program uh, within their 18 county region of the state. So uh, I know this is being broadcast throughout the state. So if you're in that part of the, um, if you're in one of those counties, uh, contact the Southwest RTC and see how uh, you can begin to structure opportunities for the businesses and let them know that that exists. Again, it's, it's kind of an outreach campaign to let them know about these resources so that uh, they have the opportunity to pursue them. So again, what are those three basic things that I talked about were necessary for a city to participate in the program? And again, I don't want to be overly biased, but uh, having the Port Authority run this administratively is easier for a city. Um, there are particulars, and I'd be happy to answer a direct question if someone else to ask, but I don't need to, I don't think, dive into that. What I would say, though, is uh, there's a simple way to do this by accessing it, uh, the program through a simple joint powers agreement. And that's uh, typically done, I think, in about a three-step stage where uh, there's interest. They will reach out, uh, the city would reach out to the St. Paul Port Authority, like Lake Pete Klein. Uh, he might come and present to the board uh, or the city council and highlight what the program is. There will be some consideration and then ultimately a resolution that would say that we want to join this program uh, would be created. So once uh, the Joint Powers Agreement via the board resolution is adopted, uh, again, they, the city gets to step back. The Port Authority, the utilities, and the energy auditors, the, 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 the photovoltaic solar developers, are the ones actually doing most of the lead work. And what they're going to do is, again, they're going to do all the background, getting the energy audit, 
submitting the application to the PACE program, having that uh, project vetted and validated and have, having cash flow positive structure, they'll approve it. The port, they being the port, would approve it. They would then again notify the city. They make that special assessment against that property. All the other things happen. The construction happens. The financing happens. The savings start to occur. The business starts to pay back uh, that special assessment, and that just gets transferred back on a semi-annual basis. So it's fairly, fairly simple um, for a city to get the benefit. Um, again, some of the basic things for the property owners, there are some restrictions for them, and one, they must be current on their mortgage and property taxes. They can't have any liens against the properties. Uh, certainly can't be in bankruptcy. This is one thing called the lender consent on the current mortgage lender. Uh, it's just the position, positioning on who gets paid first if there was an unfortunate default on this specific project, which we've talked about as cash flow positive from the get-go. <laughs> so likelihood is very low. I think there have not been, that I'm aware of, there have been a number of case projects where there have been no mortgage holders that have refused to sign this lender consent. So it's, it's required, but it's not been a, real, a real roadblock for anyone. Uh, again, I've kind of highlighted that the improvements cannot exceed 20% of the assessed property value, and the terms can be uh, up to 20 years, uh, with the caveat that it does not exceed the useful life of the equipment. So if the equipment had 11-year life cycle, uh, the term would be 11 years at the maximum. So again, last parting words of how to get started. Uh, for those that are anywhere in the state outside of the Southwest RDC, it just was really just contacting Peak Line of St. Paul Port Authority, uh, getting that board resolution adopted and that joint powers agreement signed, and really Things can start to happen from there, and we're going to be having Becky come up and talk about what's happening in Minneapolis with some of these projects that have gone through the case of the case of Minnesota program. So with that, I don't know. Questions? So who gets to decide? So uh, you know how long, how many years is spread over on your property taxes? It's going to be based on I think a couple things. One is what is the cash flow projection of the, the project itself, and then again, what's the appetite of the business, you know? Because, I mean, you're talking about it being net positive, so it could be net positive in that the lighting retrofit that pays back in a year could be extended to two years, or it could be extended to yeah. ten years, so I'm wondering how much can a business benefit from their energy savings currently using pays, and how much that's restricted? Well, I, I like you said, I look at it as, you know, the, the short-term projects, Pace is not the best tool for that. I would think that pieces could be anywhere with a term of seven to eight years, up to 15, is probably the sweet spot. Because again, there's going to be other capital with, with uh, easier to access capital, uh, you know, through loans or through the Chilling BTU program or, or, or something else. Um, but again, when they if you were to look at like a photovoltaic system, which are a number of projects have gone through case, it's pretty close to a 15-year term because there's a tax equity flip that happens, and then about year seven, year six, they'll want to transfer it over. So you're kind of in that seven to you know 15-year range. So yeah, so I understand that they attended the program and for that kind of development that couldn't happen otherwise. But from the point of view, trying to encourage energy efficiency among small businesses, how much can they sell that this will actually help them milk their savings more quickly to help their business by putting on the property tax bill? And how much would that just not be allowed by the fourth quarter guard? Not a lot of I mean, in terms of the, in terms of they wouldn't allow that long a lifespan on the, the assessment. Well, it, again, the statute allows up to 20 years, so it's really looking at the project specific uh, savings, operational savings against the cost of that 
uh, the capital that's needed, and then doing a, a simple, you know, calculation on how many years that is and what the term is. And the terms are um, tend to be based on those two primary variables, and then the interest rate is coming in around four and a half percent typically. So it's, it's low off capital as well. Yeah, question about property uh, transfer. So <clears throat> if you have a, in residential property, if you have a special assessment, there's a tendency to the resale price of the property to be a little lower, or or the buyer wants the uh, uh, seller to pay off the special assessment first. Do we have any ex experience in Minnesota with commercial property transfer with a paid assessment? Do the assessments get paid off? Do we think they're going to be a lo lower cost? For the I, I wouldn't believe that there have been any examples where there has been a property transfer. Um, because it is with property, the potential is it could stay with property, and in which case, as a buyer, I would typically want to have that somehow factored into my calculation. I think typically, and more honestly, and more practical, that assessment is going to be paid off at the transaction because the new owner is probably not going to want to deal with you know, any legacy. That's not to say that they're going to benefit from all of the energy savings from more production from that new, you know, investment or that new solar that's been put on the roof. So legally, it can stay with the property. Practically, it's probably going to be negotiated to be bought off at the uh, closing. Uh, is biomass one of the approved emissions biomass wood burners, or is that the uh, or pellet burners? Would that be a approved renewable? Does it produce energy savings that are quantifiable? Would probably fall into the. Um, I think the answer would be yes. Like the if cost of energy. Yeah. Again, if we can, if it could be demonstrated through an energy audit that it's actually going to reduce the overall energy consumption. Um, this concept is based on energy savings or energy production. Yeah. So uh, that's where that customized uh, option is left out there. And then the other question is, is this applicable to only retrofit uh, work, or could someone be you know, building a new building and building above code and stuff above code, but it comes towards this? Or mm. maybe I'm getting into these, but I'm curious. I think, yeah. I think, my hunch is it's existing. Um, uh, I guess I can look that up and, and provide Patrick uh, an answer to that. I'm Eric. thinking through the statute. Eric, I think it depends on the previous use of the building. Okay. If, it, if the um, current facility is going to have a similar use and can be compared in the last seven years, then it, it can be, um, you can use space for that. If you're constructing a completely new facility, it's difficult to set a benchmark on that. Uh, the that's benchmark is the key there. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, two short questions. Um, one is we have a lot of great utility rebates in the state. Resources. Can you talk about how they interact with the state plan? Well, the way PACE of Minnesota is structured is quite honestly, it goes through by virtue of the uh, utility energy audit. Um, that is the energy audit reference point. And what it also allows then is the identification of what those rebates will be. And then that is factored into the cost structure. Now, sometimes rebates are given out prior to construction being paid for and sometimes after. So it really gets down to from the structuring. It, you know, we have to know which, you know, is this customized payback that's going to be after construction and after validation, or is it a or for prescriptive rebate on lighting retrofits, which would be a buy-down to the overall project finances up front. Perfect. Thank you. And then my second question is, you mentioned that the sweet spot for projects is about seven or eight-year payback period, although with the financing, it can be structured to be cash flow neutral or positive from the beginning. Um, could you say a bit more about the ideal project size in terms of the dollar amount? I've, 
I haven't seen many lower than fifty thousand. Um, the sweet spot is probably about 100, 150 is what I've seen. That's not to say that I haven't seen the million dollar lighting project um, be approved as well. So, um, you know, Millville Mall up in Duluth is doing all their lighting, and that's a large project, but it's because they're converting to LED. Um, what's that going to do for, you know, the aesthetics of that? I mean, I imagine the public is going to enjoy it because, I mean, most of the time you see LED and it looks pretty good compared to what it was before. So um, they can be really big. The sweet spot is at 100, 150,000 is where I see. Have you made one here? Um, we're considering PACE. Our Environmental Commission has recommended approval of that. But the big question I know that will come up with the City Council is the liability to the city if a property defaults on their loan? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask Becky uh, from the city of the for that. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I have an opinion about it. <laughs> <laughs> there is no liability to the city. And that is because of the way that the PACE program is set up and the documentation is signed off on. Um, the mortgage lender acknowledges that the PACE is not going to go in front of the mortgage lien. So unless the city is the mortgage holder, there is no liability. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. share a whole lot more with you about great stuff happening in the state around energy benchmarking um, and other resources. Um, I'd like to now introduce Becky Shaw. She is a uh, played out and work in your community. Thank you, Becky, for joining us today. Um, such improvements are building related energy systems, mechanical systems, and renewable energy systems such as solar, thermal, and photovoltaic. Um, a portion of the energy project is paid back by special assessment. Up to 20% of the appraised value of the property can be assessed. Many projects qualify for energy rebates in addition to approval projects like fixing a street or uh, The reason that statute matters when thinking about setting up these programming in your own communities is that the state allows municipalities to issue revenue bonds to place an assessment on individual properties. The problem with that is for uh, other municipalities who have issued revenue bonds in the past. Um, it is time consuming, it's expensive, and it's often complicated. Uh, for revenue bond financing, projects less than a million dollars are often not cost justified with the issuance fee and um, some, some of the other fees that are involved in hiring the, the individuals that need to be placing those, those revenue bonds out on the market. This sweet spot is closer to $2 to $10 million or higher for issuing a revenue bond. The city of Minneapolis is a fairly large city, and we did four paid projects in our first year for a total of about $750,000. So even though it's not enough to cost justify issuing a bond. So the solution to that problem would be if one entity could issue the revenue bonds on behalf of all the participating parties in the economy. So that is when the St. Paul Port Authority stepped in and created the first program to administer PACE, they providing capital to the manufacturers of PACE. Individual municipalities can buy into the pool by entering into the uh, joint power agreement with the St. Paul Port Authority. The St. Paul Port Authority issues bonds and charges covering the projects that are being done over a certain period of time by all of the participants in the pool. The city of Minneapolis entered into a joint powers agreement with St. Paul Port Authority. My next board and legal slide is the City of Minneapolis Charter 24180. The City of Minneapolis has a charter above and beyond the Minnesota State Statute, which is specific to public purpose assessments, where an assessment is being enforced for the good of a public purpose. It requires that a public hearing must be conducted. A public hearing notice will be mailed 14 days prior to the set date. 
and then a property owner has the right to appeal by serving a notice to the mayor or city clerk within 30 days after council adopts the assessment. Um, the, the charter was written in 1989, and it was written with, with the purpose of protecting individuals or blocks of individuals who are being assessed by the public works department and giving them a right to appeal or to um, make sure that they had notification and that they had a way to get out. The reason the charter matters for setting up PACE programs is that it was written for public works when the assessment is proposed on the property owner, not when the property owner is being asked to be assessed. It does add additional timing into setting up the assessment. Most municipalities are going to go under the state charter and will not have to comply with this time. So your projects are going to go from the Port Authority to the approval process a lot faster than the city of Minneapolis is able to do. Um, the charter adds an additional 30 days onto the approval process on the back end, and in order to reverse that 30 days, we were able to draft a waiver for all of the individuals requesting the assessment for the right to appeal. We still have to hold a public hearing notice first. We have to publish a public hearing notice and hold a public hearing, which adds an additional amount of time, but we're able to uh, get rid of the additional 30 days on the back end. Um, if an individual is interested in applying for PACE, they can go directly to the Port Authority, um, call or email Keep Klein and Project Fund to Minneapolis with a sign application with our waiver. It's an estimate of the work being performed, and that is mainly so that we can also check on the payback to make sure it matches with the, the um, amount of the assessment timing and the acknowledgement of the mortgage holder to make sure that they are, that they are combined with, with that investment. Um, the City of Minneapolis drafts the public approval timeline and sends it back to the Port Authority, so it's going to vary from one municipality to another. An example would be uh, March 9th, if we receive an application, we see both the public and the public. We publish a public hearing notice by March 14th. Um, agenda setting would take place on March 25th. April 7th would be the Community Development Committee holding the public hearing and authorizing and full city council approving wouldn't be until April 17th. Um, it takes approximately three to ten days to get Merrill signed off and a copy of the council resolution. But because of that waiver, we're able to stop the clock on the initial process on April 17th. Uh, the, the important thing about the timeline that we discovered in going through some of these paid projects is that it needs to be very clear to the contractor when the, when the um, Resolution is going to be available because if there is a third party lender involved, especially with SBA, they are not going to act on anything or close on any of the finances until they receive a third party copy of that resolution. So that, that is key. Um, the assessments are placed by Hennepin County on December, or before December 1st of each calendar year, the city submits to Hennepin County per project a special assessment rate card a special assessment certification number, and registration schedule, and individual levy numbers. The assessments are sent twice annually to Minneapolis and are remitted back to the Port Authority. And now for two projects that we have done in the city of Minneapolis. The Long Island Market is located on 3815 East Lake Street. This is a grocery store that was, um, this was a building that sat vacant for several years. It was the Peterson Machinery Building, and in the 50s was originally a car dealership. Um, this, this was a really nice, um, sustainable retrofitting project. They really did take this building down to what it initially was and, and kind of revitalized it and made it look like what it initially was and then included um, high-quality insulation, freezers, lighting. Um, LED systems within the freezers and the coolers. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think Joel talks about this enough. Joel Ostrom is the owner of this business. And he just thinks it makes good business sense to, um, to top of the line energy efficiency for a grocery store. But, but really, I think that his clients would appreciate how, how efficient his business is. So for $270,000 assessed over five years, um, he, 
installed all this lighting and equipment. And like I said, I had to pay back. It's a pretty good deal. Uh, next business is LA Park Life Sciences, the excellent building. They're a bone marrow uh, support system um, located at 710th Avenue South. They uh, put in a chilled water distribution <laughs> system, insulation, and reduction of heat in their basement. The project was $219,450 after a $20,000 review and will be paid back to pace over 10 years. Uh, Miller Investments is Crankshaft Supply, a small manufacturing business located in North Minneapolis, off of Washington. They installed a solar array panel on their roof. Um, the total project cost was $179,000. They were able to get a rebate of $59,850. This was a unique project because it was one of the first ones that went through before the legislation changed the 10% to 20%. So they were only eligible for a, a assessment of 10% of the project cost, or excuse me, 10% of the assessed value of their property. So the total assessment amount was 56425 and the trillion BTU did not pay for um, renewable energy such as solar array in the city of Minneapolis and the Center for Energy and Environment with the cost of that initial investment with our own loan program. The owner's equity in this project is $63,570 and it will be paid back in nine years of assessment to myself and the Center for Energy and Environment. And the last project was the Greenway Office. Greenway Office is um, LEED certified, at least platinum LEED certified. Uh, they installed a solar array for $506,730. They got a rebate for municipal aid of over $304,000. They put in $103,000 of equity into the project and placed an assessment of $100,000 over 10 years to be paid back on the loan. Um, we do have a few other projects in the pipeline right now. One of them that came through was a lighting project. And this was for a small um, multi-tenant retail facility. And this was really an amazing project where for $58,000 they were going to be put down to the drill and facility. And the payback was going to be one, like one year and two weeks. They were, the, the annual savings was at $57,000 per year. So because of that, that savings, they had decided that pace was going to be necessary. I mean, by the time their first assessment already have paid back on this project. Um, a couple of the other ones that we have in the pipeline right now is a, a facility where during the first cold snap of the season, their boiler system went out. It was extremely old, and um, they needed to replace the entire thing. So for $340,000, their financing with participation of Trillium BTU in the city of Minneapolis is not fixing that boiler and then they'll be placing the assessment on the property to pay back over a period of seven years. And since that system went out, they're already they're also doing the system in another facility that they own, which is a very similar structure. So you need to pay back over 10 years. And in my experience, the lender acknowledgement form is extremely easy to get signed off. The lenders like seeing improvements to these properties because they are the holder, and this is a good thing for them. Um, the, the only issue that I had was on one of the projects in the pipeline right now, the city of Minneapolis is the mortgage lien holder on it, and the lady who sits down the hall from me actually did the mortgage on the one and did not know the process and how to get signed off. So that was the most difficult one that I've worked on so far, as Eric said, working with the closest And some of the other financing tools that are available to businesses, uh, pace period very well. It doesn't compete with any of the outstanding programs right now. Um, St. Paul Port Authority also has a trillion BTU program, which pays for retrofits. And that's a 4% interest rate over a period of 20 years. Um, Center for Energy Environment, they do uh, commercial and residential financing for for various projects, and they have various sources of funds. So they have a, a website where you can go and type in either your property 
your commercial property or residential property address, and we'll tell you the sources of funds available to you or the sources of grants, depending on, on where your business or home is located. And then the City of Minneapolis 2% Loan Program is for Minneapolis business owners to, uh, it's a matching loan program to purchase equipment or do improvements to their existing business. And that's up to $75,000. It has been used in participation with some of the other programs that are available. My contact information in case anybody has any questions or anything specific um, wants to see the documentation on how we set it up and things like that. Can the work only be done after the loans of the financing is approved, or can it be um, reimbursement for work that had to be done immediately? It, it depends on the source of the funding. If the property owner is depending on SBA funding or some other source of third-party funding from a bank, a lot of times the bank is not going to approve that funding until they have the resolution in hand. Um, for other projects where the same called Port Authority is financing it, which really gives you up front, then the timing becomes a little more um, more manageable, easier to work with. If the if the port is funding it, they will fund the project up front because they know what they're going to be paying back over over time. But I'm wondering, like say, um, you know, in a duplex where water heaters go out and you have to like do it right away, can then the owner apply to get funding to, to repay them for funds that they really didn't have but had to come up with on the spot? Well, they certainly can. Um, the, the issue is they're going to have to find a source of interest right. if, if teeth can't fund that for them, they're going to have to find something else to can because by the time my assessment gets placed, it's going to be the following May. So there aren't any contractors out there that are going to wait until next May. So there will have to be a, a, a middle source of money. And a lot of times the court can assist in finding that if they're not able to fund it The most amount of work for a city would be uh, doing the assessment and then collecting that money um, yearly and then, of course, transferring that to the lender, um, which is a little bit of work in our finance department. They're overworked and have concerns about it, but there's counties that do this too. Would it be better for a city to wait until your county adopted this? Now, I mean, Maplewood, Ramsey County has not adopted this, but there are counties that have. Well, it, it depends. It depends on how quick you want to get moving, and it depends on, on what your county is going to do for you. Uh, Hennepin County does pay financing, and they also do different types of property assessments and they still don't handle the, the flow of funds for the city of Minneapolis. They send them back directly to Minneapolis with the rest of our special assessments, and then we handle them. So I, I guess what I'm saying is it's going to depend on your county and what they're willing to do for, for their constituents. One final question. Um, could you talk a bit about how the city integrates these resources into your economic development work? So do you just sort of wait until an application lands on your desk, or are there activities that you have where you're going out and engaging with businesses and you're able to actually point them to uh, PACE or other resources that can help with energy projects? Well, we do get a lot of calls directly to our department, and we are also doing some outreach. Um, we have a staff member who specifically does business outreach for for energy efficiency projects and renewable energy. And when she's out talking to individuals, she will mention what we have available, what might be able to uh, help them. Um, we don't have anything in writing. We don't have a, a big marketing campaign right now because you know, technically this is not a program. We're just assisting the same help for authority with it. But um, yes, we do talk about it. We do refer people whenever we Thank you, Becky.
how this is working in our community. Sean is an environmental planner with the city of Maplewood. Uh, Maplewood has joined Green Set Cities in 2010. They were one of our first communities to sign on, and now they're recognized as, as a Step 3 city, having achieved one of the highest levels of recognition of the program so far. Um, Sean has done a lot of great work in the context of Green Step Cities and your job at Maplewood, um, complete streets and stormwater, and now tackling uh, commercial and industrial energy efficiency best practices. So we look forward to hearing about some of the really innovative work you're doing, uh, both with Excel Energy and Energy Utility and Partners in Energy, and programs you're developing in the city as well. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Amir. Amir. So uh, yes, I get a lot of variety in my job here, as you can see. Um, so I'll keep it briefer. I know we only have about 15 minutes. Um, so the city of Maplewood, of course, is a suburb of St. Paul. There's about 38,000 people. So that's the population of Maplewood. And uh, uh, Maplewood is a Green Step City. We uh, joined and were participating since December of 2010. We were awarded the Green Step City Step 3. Uh, this is a picture of Council Member Abrams uh, receiving our certification uh, that was in, at the League of Minnesota Cities Conference in June. So as you know, the Green Step Cities um, is an award and uh, acknowledgement program. And it's really uh, been a great tool for the city of Maplewood. It's helped us achieve our sustainability goals, kind of given us a, a program track in which to follow. And um, in this program, there's different areas of focus, building and lighting, land use, transportation, environmental management, and economic and community development. And what I'm going to be talking about is something that we've been tackling, and this is the green building framework. This is best practice number three in the Green Step Cities. Construct new buildings to meet or qualify under a green building framework. And action one on that is require that new city-owned buildings use a green building framework. And action number four is provide incentives to private parties that utilize a green building framework. And they define what that green building framework can be um, in the website there. Um, here's a couple of examples adopting the International Green Construction Code. Energy Star, uh, Green Globes, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, more of a performance-based, and Minnesota Green Star are a couple of those examples of a green building framework that a city can adopt to meet this best practice. So let's take a look at why we're doing this. Uh, this is from the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, they say that 39% of total energy use is from buildings. Now, we all depend on buildings, uh, it's our homes that we live in, it's uh, our places of work, our places of worship, uh, places that we shop. They're everywhere. Buildings are everywhere. And it's using 39% of that total energy use, 12% of the total water consumption, 68% of total electricity consumption, and 38% of the carbon dioxide emissions. So there's a lot of work that can be done to button up those buildings and make them more energy efficient. So I want to kind of give you a, a briefing on the City of Maplewood's work with energy. As an environmental planner with the City of Maplewood, um, I've been an uh, environmental planner for about seven years prior to that urban planner with the City of Maplewood. So, you know, they really saw uh, a need for someone to look at the environmental aspects as a local government. And so they created this position six years ago. And since then, you know, I've been doing a lot of work. Uh, city of Maplewood was the first city. 20 years to organize our trash hauling. That was a huge undertaking. Um, we, we have a living streets policy that Amir uh, commented on, and uh, we've undertaken two of those projects now. So we're really getting, getting a lot of variety, but um, about a year ago, um, Amir and Diana from uh, Clean Energy Resource Teams, um, Diana McEwen and, of course, Amir from Great Plains Institute, they they invited us, City of Maywood, to, to join into this, what they call City, City Energy Leadership Group. I think it had a different name, but this, this sounds a little bit more catchy. <laughs> <laughs> it was a complicated one, wasn't it? Yeah. So we were one of five cities participating in this program in 2014, and we met over um, 12 months, you know, one, once a month we would meet. And really the, the greatest um, gift was this technical assistance, because as an environmental planner, I'm certainly not schooled in energy. You know, I, I was basically pretty clueless, to be perfectly honest. So 
that's really what a local government needs is this technical assistance and guidance. So we worked with, again, Great Plains Institute, Metro Clean Energy Resource Team, and then other experts that they would bring in to give us presentations and fill us in on projects that they were doing. So through this, we explored opportunities to remove barriers to energy savings in commercial and industrial buildings. And here's some great slides that Amir uh, supplied us with. It kind of opened our eyes to the potential and possibility of what the city of Maplewood could do. So in Maplewood, here's our commercial and industrial buildings by size. And you can see that, of course, a majority of our buildings are under 100,000 square feet. Um, again, here, the 0 to 10,000, we have about 60% of our buildings are those smaller buildings. So there's a lot of potential there. The largest buildings in the city of Maplewood, of course, is Maplewood Mall, 3M. 3M campus is in Maplewood Borders. Uh, we have a hospital, a great uh, health um, community there by St. John's. And, of course, um, Woodland Hills Church, they were the old Kmart, one of those big box retailers that was converted into a church. And uh, Costco is a fairly new um, addition to the city of Maplewood. And in Maplewood, we have, I guess it looks like five officially certified Energy Star buildings, but um, there's estimated over 11 in that. And I, I was interested to see that we rank 10th um, among Minnesota cities in the number of certified Energy Star buildings. So I, I had no idea about that. So I was quite enthused and proud to see that. So I think our next step in um, this energy realm was applying for Minnesota Green Corps. And of course, this is monitored by or administered by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And their goal is to preserve and protect Minnesota's environment while training a new generation of environmental professionals. So in 2014 and 15, Maplewood was chosen as one of 40 host sites. And our focus area is air quality, um, energy conservation, education, and outreach. And here's our great Green Corps member, Joe Ballenby. And he has been with us since October. And uh, he'll continue on until August uh, working on our energy goals. So just uh, last November, we were, we were approached by Excel Energy. And they have this great um, partnership that they call Partners in Energy. Uh, they started a pilot project down in uh, Colorado is where they, they started this. But now have moved to Minnesota to see how it will work here. So currently, we're one of four cities participating in this Partners in Energy, um, Maplewood uh, Midtown Community Work. They are a, a group of neighborhoods in Minneapolis. St. Louis Park just signed on, and the city of Red Wing. So what is this program? So XL Energy really wants to strengthen the relationships with the community to better develop new resources to fit our community needs. So it's really kind of coming into your community and finding out what you need and what kind of assistance XL can, can offer you in saving energy and advancing your clean energy goals. Um, so really what they're looking at, you know, XL Energy has so many great rebates and different programs for uh, commercial, industrial, residential. And I think they realize now that, hey, let's tap into the local government and, and, and work, work our way out like that. Because they're the ones, you know, with the hand on the post or however that thing goes, you know, we know what's going on in our community, so let's, let's start there. And then we can take the tools that we already have and market them where they're needed. So they're offering us right now community planning, facilitation, and implementation. Um, basically, we have formed this energy action team made up of stakeholders uh, from 3M, Maplewood Mall, our councils and commissions and staff. And we are creating this energy action plan. And it's going to have uh, energy goals that are achievable within this two-year process that XL Energy will assist us with. So our planning phase will be complete in April of 2015. So we've had two workshops to date, and it's been quite interesting, facilitated by the Clean Energy Resource, CEE, Clean Energy, Center for Energy, Pardon me. See, I'm not an energy <laughs> <laughs> Center for Energy and Environment. Thank you, Yvonne. Yvonne Pfeiffer of XL, assisting us in this process. It's great to have these resources and partnerships at the local government because 
just can't know it all. So um, they've been facilitating this, and we've had two really uh, interesting uh, workshops where we've come together and we're brainstorming and we're looking at some energy data. And I wanted to share some of that with you, if I may. Sorry, this is really tricky. All right. I just wanted to point out that through this Partners in Energy, Excel Energy will offer us support over a two-year period. So, you know, you come up with these energy goals, and they're not just going to sit on a shelf. Excel is actually going to help you over two years to implement them. And some of the things they offer are these grants. Um, basically, people and resources help deliver those programs, you know, marketing materials. Let's say we want to have a big um, event at the Maywood Mall. You know, they would help us market that and, and get the word out, things of that nature. And of course, media relations. Um, so this energy data, this is a slide that they showed. I uh, just wanted to point out that when I show this, it, you know, for confidentiality purposes, it shows at least 15 by 15, which maybe Yvonne, touch on that? Uh, to be able to share the data, we make sure that the data has at least 15 entities in that data, and not one of that data point can be more than 15% of the whole. Otherwise, it's removed. Yeah, for confidentiality reasons. So, you know, the larger businesses like maybe 3M, uh, their energy use will not show up on here. But this really gives us a good idea of where our energy is being used in the city of Maplewood. And you can see that commercial and industrial is using the majority of the electricity. And this is uh, from 2011 to 2013. And this here, it's really quite interesting um, to see that a majority of our properties are residential, 91% of those. But however, uh, the commercial and the industrial is using 63% of that electricity. So there's a lot of opportunity in those commercial buildings. And then uh, this is the electricity use. Wait, I, sorry. Natural gas is a little bit more even keeled um, as far as uh, commercial versus residential. And again, you see here 91% residential use, but um, of that, the natural gas is 78% is being utilized by our residential properties. Of course, we have some long, cold, brutal winters like today, and uh, we all need, we all want to stay warm, so I think that's where a lot of that's going. Um, natural gas is, again, just kind of compares the two. You see um, the natural gas versus the electricity. So having this information has been really valuable in us formulating our goals. Uh, here we see some electricity savings, and I was pleased to see that solar photovoltaics is uh, popping up and showing a little bit of energy savings there in Maplewood. And then uh, I just wanted to give you some context here. Here's the city of Maplewood, that uh, upside down hockey stick that we call our city. Um, and you can see the 3M campus on that south leg is what we call it, and then the Maplewood Mall on that north side. So the blue areas are commercial, the yellow are mainly residential. So here's some energy data that you see um, that's mapped out. So this is our residential electricity use. And I found it interesting at the south leg, you know, we have some, uh, they'd probably be newer in terms of Maplewood, maybe about 10 to 20 years old, uh, the homes down there, but they're larger, larger homes, larger lots. You know, I guess they're utilizing more electricity to heat their, whatever, their heated garage or something. <laughs> um, so commercial electricity, we can see kind of um, in, in the Maplewood Mall area. And again, in another commercial district along Rice Street adjacent St. Paul. The residential natural gas kind of goes along with that electricity. You can see the higher use in that south leg and then uh, kind of some of those older houses near the Maplewood Mall. And then the commercial natural gas. So this has been a valuable tool now as we um, steer our goals. And then finally, I want to touch on our uh, Maplewood Green Building Code. So this was adopted in 2013 by the city of Maplewood. It does include five components, uh, energy, water, material usage, indoor air quality, and site management. So the city of Maplewood was the first city in, um, in the United States to adopt the International Green Building Code. 
which is what this code is based off of. And it's the first code that really looks at you know, the overall site, not just the building envelope. And again, uh, it's based on the International Green Construction Code and the National Green Building Standards for, for our residential properties. Um, why did the City of Maplewood choose this code? Well, the International uh, Green Construction Code does provide green and sustainable requirements that are number one, they're usable, so any building department can um, implement these into, our, into your own work, you know, and form these professional relationships and design partnerships, you know, as your commercial properties come in for um, revamping their establishments. It's enforceable. There's a consistent minimum requirements that are established. It's adoptable, you know, so jurisdictions can understand and be a contributing part of that program. And then it's adaptable. It allows for geographical differences and flexibility. We need a new clicker. <laughs> there. So in Maplewood, we made this code mandatory for all city-owned buildings. And um, there was an exception written in there, uh, building construction valuation less than $200,000. However, you know, any of those projects would still have to be reviewed by what we call our green manager, our building official. An example of that is um, our community center. They had an emergency boiler replacement. And um, in sitting down with the contractor and our parks director, the green building manager determined that, no, you really need to you know, increase the efficiency of that boiler to meet our code. So it has really helped us improve efficiencies within our building. And then it's a voluntary program. And then we uh, were adopting incentives for our privately owned commercial and industrial buildings and residential properties. This is the first building that was constructed under the Green Building Code. And this is um, our new fire station. It's located on 3M property. 3M donated some land for us to construct this new fire station, which of course benefits them because it's right there with all their large uh, buildings and so forth. So now we have um, two fire stations that will be closing and selling and taking off of our, our B3 benchmarking. And uh, this will be our new energy efficient. Um, building. But this, it was interesting to review. Um, they had a lot of mature trees, so they were able to uh, protect all the mature trees, uh, the significant trees. Um, they're capturing stormwater at a rate of you know, two inches rather than the one inch rainfall. Um, all needed plantings, you know, so looking at the overall site, including you know, the energy efficiency upgrade interior. They did look at a um, rainwater system, you know, for because this will this will house uh, firefighters, you know, um, 24 hours a day, you know, showers and, and things and things of that nature. So capturing that gray water to use for um, flushing the toilets and things of that nature, but it was just too cost prohibitive. But, you know, these are the types of things that when you have this green building code, you're, you really are focusing on and, and trying to make them work. So now to this incentive program. Um, we have received a grant from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, an environmental assistance grant in the amount of $20,000. And through our work on the city energy leadership group, we also received a grant of $5,000 from Great Plains Institute for energy efficiency grants. And with this money, we're going to start this first incentive program for our green building code. And it will be working with uh, commercial and industrial. And we hope to fund recommissioning studies. So right now we're working on an agreement and working on how we're going to market this, uh, whether we want to you know, go door knocking uh, to various entities or whether we want them to come to us. But I think through our work with um, Partners in Energy, we'll find um, areas that might uh, be receptive to this. But we would fund 100% of that recommissioning study, which uh, those average about $10,000. XL Energy offers a rebate of 75% if it's um, uh, the study finds that it's um, saving enough energy. So the city of Maplewood would in turn get that 75% rebate back and then fund the energy efficiency improvements as outlined in that recommissioning study. And uh, then in addition, you know, this is our opportunity to do this education and outreach. And we'll work with various departments, our engineering department, our um, public works department, um, to look at you know, the site. Are there any stormwater improvements 
uh, that can be made, you know, offering these grants to the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District or other districts in our city, um, looking at their domestic and wastewater, you know, how they use that building, and then um, working on recycling and trash efforts. In the city of Maplewood, if it's a small business, they can opt into our recycling program. You know, and there's just a lot of things that uh, businesses can do to improve on their trash and recycling and save money that way. So it'll be a team effort. You know, we'll go out, we'll go out there um, as a team. And then what we're hoping in return from this incentive program is that the commercial property will submit their energy data. Uh, we'll set them up on uh, B3 benchmarking. And um, they'll do that over three years. Uh, however, again, they have to implement those within nine months, those energy savings. And one of the reasons for that is uh, Xcel Energy also offers additional rebates if those energy savings are implemented within nine months. And all of those rebates then would come back to the city and help us continue to fund this program. And then, uh, again, the education and outreach um, is, is huge, you know, to, to use them as a case study, you know, and, and show how these entities can save energy and save money. And the City of Maplewood really wants to also use this as, a, as an economic development tool. I mean, the City of Maplewood is almost fully developed. Uh, we're under redevelopment now. And now this is when the hard work starts. I mean, businesses used to come to us. But now we really need to step up the game and do some economic development. And we find that um, creating these sustainable goals and, and having these partnerships with Metro Service, with Great Plains Institute, with Excel, with the MPCA, you know, it's so important for local government as you're moving forward with your sustainability goals. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, here's my contact information. Any quick questions for Sean before we wrap up? Mm -hmm. uh, Sean, has there been consistency at your city council level over the years in support of um, uh, sustainability programs? I mean, it's an impressive array in a, in a number of areas. I'm just wondering if over the like, last 10 years there's been some like, ups and downs. But I'm getting to like, like detail. Bringing up our sorted past. <laughs> Even with that sorted past, um, we've always been um, supportive of our sustainability efforts. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that they can all agree on okay. for the most part. <laughs> when the uh, green uh, building code ordinance was adopted, was there any discussion uh, about doing something like the city of St. Paul where you would have it be required for um, private invest if there's um, private development that had public investment funds in it? And, and what how did that go? I mean, obviously it wasn't adopted, but what was that? You know, I think that discussion is still somewhat in place. Um, we're looking at uh, a redevelopment project, you know, using some tax increment financing, and would that qualify for these green? So I think it wasn't something that was officially adopted in the city ordinance, but it was something that was um, in mind uh, so I don't think it's forceful at this point. With your recommissioning uh, program, so the, the idea is uh, they get a free recommissioning study, but then they still need to pay the capital for the upgrades, and then the rebates would come back to the city. So they, they will have like a financial uh, stake in this at some point, correct? Well, um, a business could uh, fund a recommissioning study for $10,000, let's say, and they receive the full 75% back, hopefully, so they get $7,500. So, uh, you know, they're only under $2,500. They take that $7,500 and they implement energy efficiency improvements. And, um, you know, so why is the city involved? Well. A lot of people don't have that $10,000 up front to do it. Um, so we, we feel that we really, this initial step, we, will, we want to use this as an opportunity to educate 
and promote the Green Building Code. So it's a free project, in essence. But then, but is, at some point, they're required to put, like, implement some of the recommendations in the set. Up to that uh, rebated amount of $7,500. Oh. Okay. okay. I guess I wasn't clear on that. Yeah. yeah so okay. basically, it would be a free opportunity for them. Uh, you know, just the commitment of submitting your energy data uh, three years previous and three years moving forward, uh, implementing those, those projects within within nine months. You know, the big question with our attorney is, well, what if they don't implement them within nine months? Well, really, the city is then only out about 2,500 because we're only going to fund projects that um, have that full 75% recommissioning rebate. And, you know, that's a small price to pay. Maybe I'll just comment to Joe, the Green Corps member with Maplewood, is probably the first Green Step City to really carry out the resources from the Light Up Your Station and Save campaign with CERT. So I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, be a peer or a mentor if your city wants to do this. So um, because he, he hit the streets and talked to station owners directly about it. So he's got some experience on that. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Great leadership by example from the city of Maple. I want to thank everybody who joined us here today in person, on the phone, and those of you who will be listening by webinar as well. I want to thank our series sponsor for the workshop, Excel Energy, and the workshop sponsor today, the U.S. Green Building Council, Minnesota chapter. And I just wanted to acknowledge that anybody listening um, wants to follow up on anything we discussed today, um, our best practice advisor, Laura Miller, from the Pollution Control Agency, Eric Green with the Department of Commerce, Division of Energy Resources, and Philip Musig and myself are both available to help point you in the right direction and answer any questions. So we look forward to all the great work that you're doing and look forward to supporting you, and thank you for joining us today. I'm